Hey guys, today we're going to be taking a look at the 12 inch Retina MacBook, specifically the model from 2017, which is the latest available refresh as of this video. So for those who aren't well acquainted with this device prior to watching this review, this thing, in a nutshell, is the smallest configurable modern MacBook that you can find as of this video. It doesn't fit under the MacBook Pro lineup of the family, but neither does it fall under the MacBook Air lineup. Rather, this one has its own lineup. Or should I say, this one had its own lineup. Just in case you haven't heard about this, it's important for me to disclose that the 12 inch MacBook lineup as of this video has actually been discontinued. Apple quietly killed it off on July 9th, 2019, and it's really unfortunate because in many ways, it's still a really nice laptop and is a laptop that you could totally buy today and be happy with it if you're in the market for a laptop that completely delivers in portability. So to say that simply, this is a laptop that I can still confidently recommend to people, but only a select demographic. It's not for everyone, so I guess my goal in this review is to tell everyone interested in the 12 inch MacBook, one, everything important you need to know about it, and two, if any of these discontinued 12 inch MacBooks will be worth your money. This might be a long review, but I hope you get something useful out of it. So let's go over the non-discounted pricing and configuration tiers real quick. There are three configuration tiers to take note of when you look into the 12 inch MacBook. Again, these are the 2017 models, which are the quote unquote latest refreshes available to you. The entry level or lower tier configurations start at 1300 bucks and come equipped with an Intel Core M3 7Y32 as your processor. This tier would be good for people who want a small premium laptop but don't need a powerhouse computer. If you're just doing simple everyday tasks and maybe some kind of light to moderate media consumption, this configuration will totally suffice. The next ones up are the mid-tier configurations, which start at $1,400 and upgrades the CPU to an i5-7Y54. Finally, the higher tier configurations start at $1,550 and upgrades the CPU to an i7-7Y75. These mid to high tier configurations would be great for those who want a small premium laptop, hopefully as your secondary computer, but will probably be attempting to engage in any sort of heavy multitasking, heavy media consumption, or heavy school or business work. Just keep in mind that these are drastically much more expensive than the lower tier models at full price. And then of course, the amount of RAM and storage that you want on your 12 inch MacBook can be configured by the tier. The 2017 12-inch MacBook models sport 7th generation dual-core processors, so if having a quad-core CPU is important to you, then you probably shouldn't be looking any further into the 12-inch MacBook lineup. But if you don't care about that, then you shouldn't have anything to worry about. Don't get me wrong, outside of comparison, these are totally decent processors. But if you know for sure that your virtual workload is CPU intensive, then I highly recommend looking into other 2019 Ultrabooks with an 8th generation Intel CPU or later, because you're much more likely to find a more performant quad-core processor in those devices alternatively. Regardless of how much RAM you get, you'll be getting a 1866MHz stick of LPDDR3 memory configurable between 8 or 16GB, which is pretty fair for what this laptop is. Furthermore, you can choose between 256 or 512 gigabytes of storage, and that's going to be an NVMe drive. Drive speeds across all of the 12 inch MacBook configurations seem to average at about 1200 megabytes per second write and 550 megabytes per second read. It's slower than most of the NVMe drives we have today, especially on the read, but I'd say this is comparable to the drive speeds of that of the 2019 MacBook Air, if not marginally faster. As far as battery life goes, I think it's pretty reasonable. I can hit 6 hours of heavy usage, which for me includes extensive web browsing with Google Chrome, emailing with the stock mail app, texting over iMessage, and using various graphics intensive software like Adobe Photoshop, Media Encoder, and Autodesk Sketchbook Pro. All on battery power. So it's not too bad, but keep in mind that my hours may vary from yours. What I really like about the 12 inch MacBook is that you can put this thing to sleep and it'll barely use any battery power. I've been able to put this thing to sleep for days and come back to it with nothing more than a percent of battery used up every time. So if you take care of this laptop well, the battery life will be phenomenal on the 12 inch MacBook. It takes 3 hours to charge from 5% to 100% with Apple's 87 watt USB-C power adapter, which is alright, but honestly much longer than I'm used to and anywhere between 6 to 7 hours using the included 29 watt brick, which is pretty bizarre, but fortunately it doesn't discharge faster than it charges. 
Thermals are good if you use this laptop for what it's built for. Obviously, thermal throttling won't occur even on the M3 and i5 configurations, as long as you keep yourself within the subjective range of light to moderate computer usage, which I'll list off near the end of this review. But just so you have a quick idea, that's including stuff like web browsing and using iMessage. You know all the basics. But if you go crazy go stupid with launching programs and multitasking between them, the 12-inch MacBook may get noticeably hot to the touch and will sporadically throttle the CPU if the temperatures get too high. The next thing I want to talk about are the ports you get. And I shouldn't really be saying that plural, because the only notable I.O. you get is one USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type-C port. That's seriously it. Just one USB-C port, and it's not even a Thunderbolt 3 port. There's an audio I.O. port on the right side, or colloquially speaking, a headphone jack, so I guess you could consider that a port too. But when it comes to pretty much all of your file transfers, connectivity with third-party accessories, and situations where you need to charge your 12-inch MacBook or power another device through your 12-inch MacBook, it's all gotta be through this one USB-C port. And that's going to be really annoying for a lot of people. It's not the most convenient selection of ports, so if you're heavy on USB Type-A accessories, you're going to need to get some adapters. Now let's talk about the 12-inch Retina display on this guy. It's one of those 16 to 10 aspect ratio displays, rocking a screen resolution of 2304 by 1440 and a pixel density of 226 pixels per inch. It's a couple hundred pixels short in width to satisfy that 16 to 10 aspect ratio, so it's not quite going to be the 2.5K display that you might be used to but hopefully that won't be such a big deal to you. In the end, it's still a beautiful and sharp laminated display with beyond average color accuracy and exceptionally great viewing angles. With the help of some color calibration utilities, photographers and other creative prosumers could make this display almost perfect in minutes. Unfortunately, it's hard to see outside under harsh sunlight, so you're going to have to find some shade or something if you'll be working outside a lot. The display's got little to no flex, which is pretty nice. I'm not sure why you'd want to get your hands on the lid like that, since this isn't a touchscreen display or anything, but some may find it pretty reassuring to know that there's very minimal screen flex. Also, do keep in mind that you are going to get some noticeable letterboxing on this display when watching most YouTube videos and movies. So if you really hate that stuff, you'll want to keep this in mind because smaller laptop displays will always make letterboxing extremely apparent. The speakers on the 12-inch MacBook are pretty fantastic. They don't have that much bass, but contrary-wise, I can confidently say that these speakers are much clearer and crisper than most speakers you'll find on Windows laptops of equivalents or Chromebooks. Like, these speakers are so good that you can comfortably play music off of them and potentially enjoy it. That's not something you can say about most laptop speakers, unfortunately. But hey, the ones on the 12-inch MacBook are phenomenal. You should really try them out. The keyboard on the 2017 12-inch MacBook is Apple's second-generation butterfly keyboard, which is pretty infamous for it not exactly being an engineering success, so to speak. It's not the best keyboard I've ever used, but when it works well, I can't help but to feel convinced that it's not the worst either. I like how Apple was able to fit in a full-sized backlit laptop keyboard with decently sized keys and physical function keys into the 12-inch MacBook. What I don't like about this keyboard is the keystroke height and key travel. If you've got big hands, the key travel is pretty much non-existent, so typing on this keyboard is going to feel extremely awkward, especially if you're coming from mechanical keyboards. Furthermore, the tips of your fingers may feel irritated after a while of typing on this keyboard because of how shallow and hard each keystroke feels due to that narrow keystroke height, so this keyboard is definitely going to take some getting used to. On another note, it's somewhat easy for dust to get into this keyboard if you use the 12-inch MacBook for a long period of time in a dusty environment. If dust gets into the keyboard, it may temporarily break keys. It's happened to me many times in college, so take my word for it. I've had broken keys from dust getting into the keyboard, which ruined some school days for me as it couldn't have been fixed until I got home to blow compressed air through the keyboard. So just be extra careful about where you use your 12-inch MacBook if you get one. In the end, if you're willing to put up with some of these physical issues and you find ways to work around the engineering issues, then this keyboard might end up being alright to you. When it works, this keyboard does have its moments of respectability. The trackpad, however, is amazing. Maybe even perfect. I'd say that it's the ideal size for a laptop. Not too big and not too small. 
easy to get used to, easy to perform gestures on, and has a sweet, quiet click that can even be muted. You'll have to experience this trackpad in person to really appreciate how quiet it can get after some tweaks, and great tracking all around. It's also rocking this 3D touch sort of functionality, which is where it gets its name, the Force Touch trackpad. It's cool to have, and sometimes can be a time saver, but I don't think it'd be super useful to the average consumer, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about it. It's just a fun feature that enhances this trackpad's usability to a degree, but it's not essential enough of an experience to talk about. In the end, great trackpad. I think it's absolutely amazing. Two things I didn't go super in depth about is the built-in webcam and the microphone, so I'll just give them a quick one-liner. They both get the job done, but I really, really dislike the webcam quality. I try not to use the webcam because of how ridiculous the quality is, but if you need it, it's there. So the 12-inch MacBook is pretty interesting, right? Even though it has compromises in certain areas, such as the port selection and arguably the keyboard, it still has a lot of nice things going for it. Plus, you can get around some of these hardware dilemmas pretty easily if you know what to do. And that sort of leads into this. The reason why I'm still very confident in being able to recommend this laptop to certain people is because, outside of comparison, this laptop does have a ton of respectable hardware that makes this laptop very fitting to be any one secondary computer or even someone's first computer if you're willing to stretch it that far. Besides, it's not the type of MacBook you'd get for its internals, but rather for its size, because that's a category where the 12-inch MacBook completely delivers, hands down. I get it though, that's a pretty bizarre concept to take in at first, since, you know, when you get any kind of computer, ideally you'd want a powerful one that would perform exceptionally well for a long period of time, right? But with the 12-inch MacBook, I think most people can overlook the hardware limitations most effectively as long as you get it as your secondary computer. Okay, now I think we can all agree that gaming and video editing is a no-go with this one. That should be obvious. Ideally, anything graphics intensive shouldn't be attempted on the 12-inch MacBook lineup of computers since it only has integrated graphics. However, color grading is an exception as long as you're grading photos, not videos. Everything else outside of graphics work should be doable, at least to some degree, and here's a small list of what that includes. Light to moderate media consumption, web browsing, even with Google Chrome, mass file management tasks, writing papers, creating charts, or building presentations with suites like Office 365 or iWork, student work, light business work, and programming. If your workflow is limited to a combination of any of the things I just mentioned, then you'll most likely find this laptop quite beneficial for you, considering what it is. More so if you get this as your secondary computer. As a side note for artists, you could probably draw on this laptop too and make some nice artwork on it, given that you're using an external dedicated drawing tablet and you're not using Photoshop to follow through with your illustration tasks, but I wouldn't recommend doing this seeing as to how pretty much any of the iPads or Microsoft Surfaces would be a much better choice choice for most hobbyist artists. And if you're a professional artist, well, ideally you shouldn't be using any kind of ultrabook at all, right? I did mention that you could color grade photos on this machine, and I just wanted to reinforce that statement further. Yes, the 2017 12-inch Retina MacBook can handle raw photos pretty well, so photographers could make exceptional use of this laptop for when they're out on the field, snapping photos, and he is super thin, super light laptop for grading their work on the go. In fact, I think photographers would enjoy this laptop the most out of all of the people that this laptop appeals to. I do this quite a lot, so I can guarantee you that the 12-inch MacBook is a good option for those who need a portable color grading machine. The only thing that's going to be particularly annoying to you is the port selection. You'll need adapters for all of your interfaces. As for programming, it's totally doable on the 12-inch MacBook, although the display is smaller than what most programmers would be comfortable with, so this may not be the most comfortable laptop to be coding on. It is just a bit smaller than the Surface Pro 6's display though, and I've said in my review of that device that programming feels comfortable on that display as long as you practice good style, for those who know what that means. So if you practice good programming style and you code on simple text editors or compact IDEs like Visual Studio Code, then I think you can make things work. And then of course, if you're a high school or college student using this laptop to get basic schoolwork done on the go, like essays and stuff like that, this is more than capable, no questions asked. Okay, that was my review of the 12-inch MacBook. It's a great laptop that I honestly think is greatly misunderstood. Overall, this laptop is close to my vision of the ideal thin and light ultrabook. 
it looks great and it's got great battery life, awesome speakers, a really nice display, and is so thin and light that I could put it in my backpack's tablet sleeve and almost forget about it. If you thought the MacBook Air felt like air, you really haven't held this guy yet. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys again in my next video.